Hello. Sorry, I'm trying to fix this up. Uh, if you're wondering, um, I use Zoom to record stuff, but <clears throat> even that's not that good. Welcome. I'm uh, doing that. Um, uh, this time we're doing we're focusing on African history, uh, history in the uh, Madagascar. Now this isn't going to be in the 19th century, and if you know anything about Africa, it's all about partitioning, you know. And I chose Madagascar because I took French. I took a j'ai étudié le français en au lycée, and uh, during my uh, four years in um, high school, I remember my first year. I took a, I was assigned a francophone country, a country that spoke uh, French or français, and I got to Madagascar. I didn't go into you know the history of it or anything, but I like the you know the country more enough because it's kind of like you know uh, Britain, Britain uh, in the sense that uh, it's like an island separated from the continent, but still considered part of the you know part of Africa. <clears throat> so I thought you know what the hell let's go into it. So Madagascar, um, we're going to be talking about one of its uh, the last queen of Madagascar or the Marina Kingdom. That's what it's referred as. By the way, a person of, uh, from Madagascar, it's a uh, I think you called them a Malagasian, Malagasian. I don't know. I'm going to call them a Malagasian in case I have to use, you know, people from Madagascar. And her, the name of the queen is uh, Renavolona uh, III. By the way, sorry if I can't, uh, if I butcher names, I'm going to try to avoid speaking anything in um, uh, Mal Malagasy or Malagasy, the, the language, because they are very long. I mean, the name of a person could be can have like oh my god like 20 letters in it i don't know <clears throat> so yes rena valona the third the end of an era now i want to start off with talking about madagascar uh, the marina kingdom so this time as i mentioned uh, european powers are partitioning up uh, Ma uh africa and in this case uh, for madagascar notably france the monarch uh, from, from uh, what i can gather is uh, it became constitutional I'll talk about how he became that later on. And uh, the nobles and prime minister have power. Uh, we, we had a fun fact of when a new monarch steps up, you know, uh, if it's a female, she has to marry the prime minister. So prime minister, uh, yeah, uh, he's been, um, uh, he's been modernizing uh, Madagascar. He's been pretty doing a, uh, he's a pretty good job. However, you know, even though um, it's been, Madagascar at this time it's really um modernizing rapidly, you know. Not like it's kind of like Japan, but it's still far below uh the required uh, uh prestige and power to resist the European countries. So um the early years are of uh Rana Valona the third. She went to by a different name, but I don't want to talk her her name is easy enough to say, so uh she was very well educated, you know. If you want a good education, it has to be usually, uh, you know, European for uh, for people of a uh, low class or, you know, not very uh, civilized. She was very fond of the Bible and Christianity. And you have to know that in uh, Madagascar, Christianity, to be a Christian, it's not very well accepted. Although at, at this time, uh, Madagascar, the monarch is starting to accept the Christians more. Uh, she married a nobleman uh, named uh, Retro... Retrimo, who dies. Some people say the prime minister killed him, you know, because as I said before, that prim the prime minister usually marries the monarch right now. So she's a widow. Um, yes. The aristocratic revolution of 1863, it's it, what makes the monarch constitutional. And um, it's kind of complex, but, or I didn't read, I'm like glossing over a lot of things. So, you know, bear with me. It just gives more power to the nobles and the prime minister. And uh, the monarch is uh, constitutional, meaning it has no uh, real power. It's not going to be absolute. So uh, for her reign, uh, Rana Valona, she's not going to be doing anything. You know, she's not going to be handling uh, state affairs. That's going to be the work of her government or really the prime minister. Now, she's uh, made queen uh, at age 22. Uh, and as I said, it's, she has a political marriage to the prime minister, but... Sorry if I for the misspelling spellings again. I should really uh, check my slides. To uh, the prime minister, um, uh, notes that she'll never have any children. You know, so it's you know politics. Nothing for love. Um, 
I, once again, uh, she does not handle state affairs, but acts as a figurehead of state, you know, just signing off documents and all that. And she leaves um, from my, from uh, what I can tell is she leaves in a relatively peace, you know, just gossiping, uh, what is it, parlor games or something, you know, just hanging out while um, she was very fond of uh, French culture. And, uh, you know, because it's, cause the top European uh, cultures to, you know, like our French or English or, or British, sorry. And she, uh, she kind of likes French more, which I respect. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Sorry, uh, I had to like borrow the background from uh, another slideshow, you know, getting another different type, type of templates. And I guess uh, they had some, their own transitions. So sorry if it's gonna, we if it's weird, you know, when, it, when I move back and forth, I don't know. However, let's talk about the main thing. The Franco Hova, the Franco Hova Wars, um, I don't know why it's called Hova, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm sorry if I'm not going to this too much detail because I'm really just focusing on the queen. France is, um, it's very sneaky. It doesn't just, it doesn't take over uh, Madagascar because um, it, one, one, it's going to look very um, barbaric and it's going to make uh, France, uh, you know, low in prestige in the world. So it, what it does, it, it takes over cities and, you know, inherit inheritance, you know, uh, some Frenchmen end up inheriting um, some coastal cities. Uh, it's the coast because uh, at this time, even though the Europeans have the have the equipment to actually, you know, uh, prevent themselves from getting too much disease and you know dying and going into inland, it's not that effective. Um, you'll see that. Um, uh, you'll see later that disease. As you go more into you know into inner um, Africa or even inner Madagascar, there's a good chance that if you're a European and you're not native to the to the um, the lands, there's a good chance you could still you know pass die from a disease. I think it's really those um, mosquitoes and all that. The first war, um, it's not really a uh, a war for sake. Um, it's just France taking a bunch of um, coasts and all that. The kingdom. Uh, repels them, but it's more from a uh, diplomatic pressure from other uh, Europeans. However, the kingdom is left broke with no money because uh, the terms the terms of the war, it's very sketchy and very ambiguous. Britain, however, um, after the first war, it's going to be busy with uh, other far territorial claims, you know, and wants uh, other lands in, in you know, in uh, mainland Africa. And it's going to focus on those and also Egypt. So, it's not going to care much, too much about uh, Madagascar because they really don't have any claim at this point, you know? Uh, France uh, leaves the, the first treaty ambiguous. Now, what I mean is that France, in order to uh, colonize and take over Madagascar, it needs to make Madagascar a uh, French protectorate, meaning that France would take over the... Um, the um, Interaction between the island and you know with the world, you know, take over or uh, some have take over uh, administrative um, duties, you know, and then it's gonna implement you know some actual laws to take over uh, Africa through law or through force. Now, uh, yes, so Madagascar keep um, it doesn't want to be a French protectorate because it knows what that means. They'll know that. By being a French protectorate, it's going to basically give up its uh, independence, you know, both symbolically and, you know, literally. However, they keep debating for a long time until France um, gives a hard ult ultimatum to the kingdom, which is rejected. I, uh, for my, what I can tell, it's, um, there was really nothing Madagascar could do. The ultimatum, from, I can, from what I can get, was, um, to pay first off, pay France a lot of money, which it's gonna, it's not gonna break Madagascar's kingdom because the economy was poor, right? But it's gonna make the kingdom crippled in terms of economics. And I and it said uh, France to um, gain more coastal cities and to have a, a say in, in government, I think. But the kingdom hat refuses because the prime minister. Uh, he wants uh, Madagascar independence, you know, and he doesn't want to give France, who already has a bunch of um, 
cities on their of their own on the coast and you know a lot of uh because it's because the previous treaties and you know negotiations were all centered mainly towards france you know so france uh the ultimatum is rejected and they declare war la guerra madagascar so french forces invade the coast and march inland towards the capital uh and ten and uh, yeah i'm not gonna say that oh wait there's french uh and then they leave but the main uh force uh, i think they sent fifteen thousand people fifteen thousand uh, soldiers and i think a good chunk of a a, a lot of them uh died from a disease because you know disease is still a major problem for europeans but the Madagascar forces hold out for three days until they have to capitulate. Uh, Rene Vel- uh, Lona has to have the has task of uh, signing a treaty, making uh, Madagascar a French protectorate. So basically just giving full control of Madagascar uh, to uh, France, you know. It's not a colony officially, but, you know, pretty much at this point it is. The previous prime minister is exiled and he later dies. So he's uh from from my, what I can what I can read uh the um, the French considered him a uh, well the negotiator. Uh, he considered the prime minister a um, a hard fighter for uh, Madagascar's honor and all that. So he was a pretty notable and I think in my opinion, uh, even though it's you know not that much knowledge, pretty reasoning. He's a good prime minister. Now this is this uh France didn't like exactly um they didn't like end the monarchy, but they pretty much stripped the monarch and the government of all real power. So they're basically just there to as a figurehead. The government as a whole is now a figurehead, you know, like the queen. However, there's something um when the capital falls, a rebellion break, breaks out, the uh, Menelamba rebellion, it breaks out. Initially, it's not really it's like, you know. Can be seen and it can be seen as you know some guerrilla fighters, you know, a little bit of them, you know, but it quickly it grows a lot, you know, to the point where France, the French authorities have to uh, replace their uh, governor, who is more of a civil governor, with a military one, and they don't trust the monarch because they think they might have uh, sparked a rebellion or sparked some, uh, you know, told the people to rebel, but the rebellion and in, in uh, hindsight. It wasn't really to support the monarch. It was just really to um, to go back to the old ways, you know. Because this this rebellion also attacked the uh, the Christians, you know. And as I said, um, Rene Valona the Third was a Christian herself, right? And they saw her as a uh, kind of a betrayal, you know, to old uh, uh, Malagasian uh, uh, traditions. So, but it's not really, but. Nevertheless, you know, the monarch is tied to the rebellion and she's her government is done for. So they no longer trust the uh, queen and they exile her to Reunion Island, which is not too, it's like a little island far away from uh, not too far away from uh, Madagascar. Yeah, but uh, it's they think it's too close. So they exile her, uh, uh, the queen to Algiers, which all the way to Algeria, northern Africa. And at first, it's kind of sad because she's giving low allowance, not that much money to live on. However, she um, she's really fond of France and French culture, and she's from. It was kind of funny um when she uh, arrives when she went to Algiers, she was kind of disappointed that she didn't you know she couldn't get a trip to uh Paris you know, but she did. She uh, eventually she got the, she saved up enough money to go to uh, France. And each time, a uh, public um, sympathy. Oh my God! Uh, I'm gonna check the transition sex. <laughs> but yeah, she'll she she gains a lot of crowds and guests when she visits visit, uh, visits uh, France, and that uh, growing uh, they feel bad for her. You know that growing uh, public French sympathy. Ironically, it's what helps uh, build up her uh, allowance because you know people keep you know just crying out about how. The poor situation the, the queen, you know, has gone herself into. 
So she has enough money to go to Paris, she goes to Bordeaux, a lot of, uh, she visits all of France, you know. So it's not like a whole, uh, you know, just like vacation, like a fun vacation. She also goes to uh, the Palace of Versailles, go figure. But she really misses, you know, home. She gets homesick, you know. And even though she's in Paris, in France, um, she's uh, she doesn't really experience a lot of racism, but there's a lot of uh, remarks by the local newspapers that her looks, because she likes to have, you know, French culture, so she likes to wear uh, French clothes. She doesn't look Parisian enough, you know. And that uh, she's, they call her a uh, civilatrice. They call her like an uh, example of a queen being civilized by uh, society because they, they don't, they, they don't really like, they don't really think of her culture for, um, Malagasian culture as, you know, another culture. They think of it as, as a barbaric, you know, how the Romans viewed the old bar- barbarians, you know. So she asked some, um, you know, several times for France uh, if she can go back home, you know, but they, she's always refused. And it gets to a point where, uh, yeah, she dies. She never returns back to uh, Madagascar. She dies uh, peacefully from uh, at the age of uh, 55 in uh, 1917. Note that this is during the World War One, and during World War One, when it breaks out, uh, France uh, refused her uh, more request to return her back to France. Like she couldn't visit France again because of you know the war, so it's a whole different situation. And she never had any kids. She had an, a niece who she adopted as a heir. She she uh, that niece went on to become a nurse, but even she 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 uh, died childless as well. So there's no, uh, the bloodline ended with them. Her remains were b- buried in Algiers and, you know, later uh, in the Rova de, uh, of the capital. So her ashes did return to uh, Madagascar. However, there's a, there was a huge fire in the, because it was a royal uh, cemetery, royal um, tomb for, you know, many royals. There was a huge fire that destroyed a lot of, you know, remains of people. But fortunately, uh, her remains were um, uh, saved, and not the you know, if not the only ones saved. So, so uh, her remains are you know preserved. They're still there. I don't know where they went though. Uh, I didn't go too much into it, but um, yeah. Um, fun fact: when uh, her remains went back to uh, Madagascar, you know, at, during the twentieth uh, century, or was it? Yeah, twentieth 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 century. I remember reading something about her, uh, the French government there, um, telling the people to, you know, pay their taxes so uh, they can uh, help um, re-innovate her tomb, you know, and to, uh, you know, respect her memory by paying us taxes, you know. None of those, uh, none of the people did it, did so, because they know that the French are um, just using her death as a pretext for gaining more sympathy and, you know, control over the people. So, Yeah. I didn't go too much into uh, the colonization of uh, Madagascar, but uh, but yeah, it's a poor, sh- it's a shame uh, how uh, you know a queen she didn't even do anything, you know. But the past royals of uh, Madagascar, uh, I think there was slavery in Madagascar, but it doesn't matter. She didn't really do anything, you know, just a victim of circumstance. The French pretty much were. Uh, aching to just take over Madagascar and, you know, they got their way. But unfortunately, that led to the end of a lot of history, you know. Yeah, um, I plan to cover more uh, African history. Sorry if this is a bit short. I plan to cover a lot of African history or more African history. Uh, uh, yeah, I will say that uh, the African history I will cover will be during the time of partitioning. However, the next one um, I, co- I plan to cover, you know, I'm not sure when the video might came out, you know, because I have another great uh, idea in mind. But the other, uh, to give you a hint and sneak peek, uh, the other uh, African history will be uh, about, it will be during colonization, you know, partitioning of Africa. However, it will, in, it will have a very stark contrast to what happens to Madagascar, you know. And um, yeah, I'm just saying that it'll, uh, it'll just be about that. They will uh, have a different fate than what happened to Madagascar. I'll say that.
So yeah. Uh I guess uh see ya. <laughs>